I am in the book of Habakkuk this tonight. Habakkuk. If you have problems finding Habakkuk, because it's not going to be on the board, you get to Matthew and you turn back. And if you fall by Micah, you just missed Habakkuk. We all there? Yes. It's good to be in the Word of God, looking, reading along, so that you would know exactly what's taking place. Verse 1, chapter 1. The burden which Habakkuk the prophet did see. O oh Lord, how long shall I cry? and you will not hear. Even cry out unto you of violence, and you will not serve, save. Why do you show me iniquity and cause me to behold grievance? For spoiling and violence are before me, and there are that rise up strife and contention. Therefore the law is slacked, and judgment that never go forth. For the wicked doth compass about the righteous, therefore wrong judgment proceedeth. Behold you among the heathen, and regard and wonder marvelously, for I will work a work in your days which you will not believe, though it be told you. If you could keep your Bibles open, we would continue later on. Well, let me say to us tonight that unlike other prophets in the Bible, Habakkuk is more representative of you and me and the children of God than any of the other prophets that we can read about. I say this based on the fact that other prophets, the, the other prophets, heard from God and they spoke to the people as they heard from God. So the dialogue was God to prophet, prophet to people. A common line from them was, thus saith the word of the Lord. Another is, thus saith the Lord. And Ezekiel is famous for the word of the Lord came unto me saying. So always it was from God to prophet to people. But in our text, Habakkuk was having a conversation with God. And not only that, he was questioning God. And he was questioning God about his unresponsiveness to his cries. God was not responding to Habakkuk. And this is why he asked the question of God, O oh Lord, how long shall I cry? And you will not hear, even cry unto you of violence, and you will not save. God seemingly was doing nothing about Habakkuk's cry. So that Habakkuk had been crying out to God to stop the wrongdoing he saw among God's people, Judah. There were those who were walking uprightly before God, but the majority of them were in apostasy, and they were doing all kinds of wrong things in the eyes of God to the people of God. There was violence, there was iniquity, and a lot of injustice. Yet, God seemed to be doing nothing but tolerating violence, injustice, and the destruction of the righteous. Habakkuk was a very, I would say, brave prophet because he asked the Lord in verse 3, why do you show me iniquity and cause me to behold grievance? 
For spoiling and violence are before me, and there are those that rise up strife and contention. He was describing to God all that was taking place in Judah as if God didn't know what was going on. Why God? Why is there so much injustice and you're not hearing me? And why are you not doing anything about the injustice? Could I say to you tonight that this is typical of many a child of God who is living in a perplexing situation because of another person or persons as the case may be. I don't know if there are any of you here tonight. I presume there are. Because God will not send this word unless he knows that there would be those of you who are here, who would be here, and would benefit from this message. So let me say again, this is typical of many a child of God who is living in a perplexing situation because of another person or persons as the case may be. Or it may be at the workplace, in the neighborhood, or any other place where we have to interface with people. But it matters not wherever it is and whomsoever is involved. When there is wrongdoing or injustice of any kind and we cry out to God continually, when there seem to be no response from God, it is easy to become disillusioned, begin to question God, and form wrong conclusions. Am I talking to anybody here tonight? Yeah. <laughs> Having cried out to God about the injustice and the seemingly not responding by him, Habakkuk concluded, and we saw it in verse 4. He says, and he's talking to God. Remember, this is a conversation with Habakkuk to God. He's a prophet. Prophets, as I said, heard from God and speak to the people. But this is Habakkuk talking to God about his people. So he concluded, because God was not responding to him, he concluded that God was not seeing, because he was telling God what was taking place. He concluded that God was not hearing, and this is the conclusion he came to. He said, therefore, the law is slacked. Verse 4. And judgment never goes forth. For the wicked that can pass about the righteous, therefore wrong judgment proceeded. The question tonight is, why does God wait so long to punish evil? Those of you who are in prayer meetings with us on Tuesdays, you would know that we pray about this nation Tuesday after Tuesday after Tuesday. We pray about the criminal elements. We pray about the violence. And it just goes on and on and on. It's just like in the case of Habakkuk. It's as if God is not hearing. So why does God Wait so long to punish evil. Why are our prayers generally not answered quickly? When we have a somebody in our life that's persecuting us, giving us no end of trouble, we go on the job, it's there on the job. Our neighbors do it to us. Why is God not hearing? Sometimes in our very homes, we are crying out to God for what's happening in our homes. Many of us today in the body of Christ, either vocally or silently, come to this conclusion where we question God's justice when he seemingly is unresponsive to our cries. Listen to me. Injustice is not a nice thing. I don't know if you are like me, but I hate, I 
just absolutely hate injustice. Like Habakkuk, frustration can cause us to come to wrong conclusions at times. It was not that God did not hear Habakkuk's cries. Hear how he's charging God. How long shall I cry and you will not hear? This was his charge. It was not that God was not hearing Habakkuk's cry. God is omniscient, isn't he? Omniscient means he knows all things. Not when they are happening, not after they have happened, but he knows the things before they happen, when they happen, and long after it happens. And unless it is a sin, your sin and my sin, that he says, I will remember your sin no more, there is nothing that God forgets. He can't forget because he's omniscient. The Bible tells us that the God of Israel never slumbers nor sleeps. So what is he doing? He has to be doing something if he's not slumbering, if he's not sleeping. So if he's not slumbering and sleeping, then he must be hearing. He says, the very hairs on your head are numbered, and not one strand falls out without him knowing. God takes account of every strand of hair of every one of his children. Some of you don't give him any problems with that at all. <laughs> and not looking down there. So in effect, he's telling us his eyes are always on us. He knows everything about us so that there is no question of him hearing when we talk to him. When we even think he hears. There is not a cry. Listen to me, if you are here tonight and God is speaking to you through this word. There is not a cry. There is not a prayer. There is not a request or a spoken word that God does not hear. So tonight, if you are in the place of Habakkuk, you have been crying out to God for some time and you are thinking that he has not heard, Know for sure it is impossible for God not to hear you. He made some statements in the Bible. He says, if you regard iniquity in your heart, God will not hear. He will choose not to hear your call. But apart from that, he hears every cry. And if you have been crying out for injustice in however form it may take, then know that God has been hearing your cry. He knows all that is happening. And he will respond. If you feel the way Habakkuk felt, that God was not hearing you, I want you to know, among the people in the Bible, you are not alone. You are not alone. Listen to David. Who was David? King over Israel, anointed by God, appointed by God. I made the statement some time ago. God said of David, David didn't say this of himself, God said it of David, a man after my own heart. One would think that when David cried to God, the answer will come immediately. But listen to David in the Psalms. How long, no, yeah, on one and one occasion he cried out, how long will you forget me, O Lord? Imagine that. He's asking God, how long will you forget me? Forever? This tells me that he had been crying out for a very long time to ask the question, forever? 
But we must understand that God's timing is not our timing. God doesn't wear a watch like us. He asked the question again, how long will you hide your face from me? How long shall I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart daily? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? This was King David. In Psalm 22, he cried out again, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? Oh, my God, I cry in the daytime, but you hear me not, and in the night season, I am not to silent. Does that sound familiar to you? But Habakkuk was not only concerned that his cries went unheeded, that was one aspect of the thing, but the situation continued to be unchecked. So on the one hand, he felt God was not hearing him, and on the other hand, he sees that God is doing nothing about all the violence, all the injustice that's taking place in the land while he is crying out. And then God answers Habakkuk. And then God answers Habakkuk. How many of you have had an and then God experience in your life? Let me see your hand. You have been crying out to God. You have been crying out. You are thinking God is not hearing you. And then God moved on your behalf and resolved the situation one way or the other. I call it an and then experience. So Habakkuk had an and then experience. An experience when God responded to him. I am here to tell you tonight on behalf of the Lord Jesus Christ that no matter what your situation is, how long you have been crying out, you are going to have an and then God experience relative to your given situation. No matter what the situation, no matter how long you have been crying out to him, no matter how unresponsive he may seem to be, there will always be and, and then God experience happening in your life. Why? Because God said it. God has said it. He said, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Do you know where, when is never? Never. You know what never means? Never means never. So it matters not if it goes on for months, years. God says he will never forsake you, which means that he's going to be involved in your situation at all times. So, loved ones, it's only a matter of time. God has not forgotten you. God has not forsaken you. Remember I said God would have sent this word because he knew that you would be here, whoever this word is for tonight. It's definite. It's specific. It's directional. It's coming to some people directly from the throne room of God. So what is the and then experience that Habakkuk had? Verse 5. And then God spoke. God answered Habakkuk. He said, Behold you among the heathen, and regard and wonder marvelously, for I will work a work in your day which you will not believe, though it be told you. Oh, what an and then experience. This is God now. 
for the first time, speaking to Habakkuk after all the years of, that Habakkuk had been crying and not hearing from God, God now answers Habakkuk and he says, now you look out and see. Behold you among the heathen, those people that are behaving so badly, and regard and wonder marvelously, for I will work a work in your days which you will not believe though it be told you. How many of you would like God to work such a work in your day? So great that you cannot believe it even if you are told that it was happening to you. You could not believe it because it was so great. At this point, Habakkuk, like so many of us, would be rejoicing in our heart, wouldn't we? Oh, yes, to get a response like that from God, we should be rejoicing, thinking finally that God is going to work in our situation just the way we expected. How many of you know when we cry out to God, we always have in our mind how God should do what we want him to do? Oh, yes, we always have the answer to the problem, but we can't find the answer, so we cry out. So thinking finally that God was going to work in his situation in a way that was so exceeding, God continued and he says, for lo, I raise up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation which shall march through the breadth of the land to possess the dwelling places that are not theirs. They are terrible. You know, God have a way when he wants to tell you something, he could really rub it in, you know. <laughs> you know, remember when he took Abraham up on, Mon on the mountain to slay his son, he said to Abraham, take thy son, thine only son, whom thou lovest, carry him up the mountain and kill him. He has an uncanny way of just rubbing in things, you know. He says, for I, lo, lo, I raise up the Chaldean, Chaldean, that bitter and hasty nation, which shall march through the breadth of the land to possess the dwelling places that are not theirs. They are terrible and dreadful. Their judgment and their dignity shall proceed of themselves. Their horses are swifter than the leopards and are more fierce than the evening wolves. And their horsemen shall spread themselves and their horsemen shall come from far. They shall fly as the eagle that hasted to... E this is God telling he Habakkuk what he was going to do in answer to his cry. They shall come all for violence. Their faces shall sup up as the east wind, and they shall gather the captivity as the sand. And they shall scoff at the kings, and the princes shall be a scorn unto them. They shall deride every stronghold, for they shall heap dust and take it. This was what God had promised Habakkuk when he says, I'm going to work a work so marvelous in your days you will not believe it even if it was told you. You see, sometimes when we cry out to God, we cry with an expectancy. And we have it all in our minds exactly how God is going to respond and resolve our situation. So no longer was Habakkuk dissatisfied that God was not hearing him. He had a no problem. His problem was how God was going to handle the situation. It was not the way Habakkuk expected. 
Hello? Hello? It was not the way Habakkuk expected and was appalled that God will use such a wicked nation to attack Judah. God was saying, I'm going to bring down this wicked nation. You're crying out for help. You want me to answer? Well, here is the answer. I'm bringing down the Chaldeans, and I'm telling you how bad they are, and they're going to run over the whole of Judah, and they're going to take captives. <coughs> how often as children of God, we have issue with the way God chooses to handle situations that we cry out to him about. I don't know about you, but I've had a few issues with the way God handled some situations. Of course, after, the, after I had the issue and I saw how he worked it out, I realized that God is wiser than me. I don't know if you think you're wiser than God, but I have come to the conclusion he's much wiser than I am. And he did not keep us ignorant to the fact that his ways are not our ways, that his thoughts are not our thoughts. When God chose to do something on our behalf, we must understand, we must come to the conclusion that God knows best. We don't know. That's why we are crying out to him. He knows everything about everything, past, present, and future. So he did not keep us in ignorance. His ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. This is why we are told that we are to trust him. We are to trust him. We can't lean to our own understanding of things. Just acknowledge him, he says, in all our ways, and he says he will direct your path. So we're going to fast forward a bit because there's a lot that happened between the cry and after the answer, there's a lot that happened. But we're going to fast forward it because of time to chapter 3. And in chapter 3, verse 16, Habakkuk says, when I heard the sweet way you're going to answer me, when I heard, my belly trembled, my lips quivered at the voice, rottenness entered into my bones, and I trembled in myself that I might rest in the day of trouble. When he cometh upon the people, he will invade them with his troop. But then he continued. He says, although, although the fig tree shall not blossom, neither shall fruit be in the vines, the labor of the olives shall fail, and the fields shall yield no meat. The flock shall be cut off from the fold, and there shall be no herd in the stall. Yet, yet, I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength, and he will make my feet like hinds feet, and he will make me to walk upon high places. Hallelujah. Habakkuk's conclusion was that in every way and in any situation, no matter what, he was going to rejoice in the Lord. In so doing, he would be testifying that he served God not for what he gives, but because he was God. Could I say that to you again? Because it's so important. There are a lot of people in the body of Christ who serve God because of what God can give to them. They're always looking at his hands, not his face, but not so with Habakkuk. 
In spite of all that was going to happen, Habakkuk was afraid. He was trembling. You read it. His, his, there was rottenness in his bones. His, his stomach, his belly trembled and all that. Yet he says, I am going to rejoice in the Lord. I don't care what is happening. I am going to rejoice in the Lord. And in so doing, he would be testifying. I am saying this. He would be testifying that he served God not for what God could give to him, but because God was God. Yeah. That's the best way to serve the Lord. Too often, too often, and it bugs me as a pastor, too often people want to walk away from God because they don't get what they tell God to give them. No, God is not there for that. Thank God that you could inhale some air. Thank God that you have two feet that you can walk. And thank God even if you have one foot, you could get a crutch to hop along. We ought to be thankful to God for everything. Even the, the, the situations that are negative in our life. Why? Because he's always at work. He never slumbers. He never sleeps. He's working behind the scenes so that the negative things that are happening in our life, he's working, he's working, he's working. He's doing something on our behalf. He said it, Jeremiah 29, 11, I know the thoughts I think of you. They are good thoughts and not evil so that you can have the expected end, the end that I have determined for you. I mean, when we have a God like that, no wonder Habakkuk say, can say, I will rejoice no matter what. I don't care about the fig tree not having fig. I don't care if you don't have Pomerac and Pom City, as long as I could get a little mango sometimes. Thank you. <laughs> the Lord God is my strength, and he will make my feet like hinds feet, and he will make me to walk upon high places. What is a hind? A hind is a female red deer. It's red. It is also a type of deer that lives on steep, rocky, mountainous terrain. And are so sure-footed that they can run and climb over the rocks just as if they were on flat land. So when Habakkuk says, that God will make his feet like Heinz feet. You look at the rocky situations that you have to run over and know that God is going to take you over there because he's giving you the feet to climb over whatever comes your way. This is what Habakkuk was saying. Are you serving a different God to Habakkuk? I am not. I am serving the same God that Habakkuk served. And I don't believe that God loved Habakkuk more than me because Jesus didn't die for Habakkuk, but he died for me. Amen. Hello. Amen. So what Habakkuk was saying is that in praising God in and through difficult circumstances, God will give you the strength God will give you the strength to get over the most difficult of circumstances. We may want the circumstance to change, but listen to me. God's plan may be to change us in the circumstance. And in so doing, he will enable us to handle each and every circumstance that comes our way. He makes our feet like hinds feet. So tonight we are going to stand and we are going to do we are going to do the Habakkuk thing. All right, when you stop watching the people going up there to pray. We're going to stand and we're going to do the Habakkuk thing. We're going to rejoice in spite of, regardless of, it matters not. We are going to rejoice in the Lord. Come on, Nick, let's go. This is 
is the Habakkuk thing. Let's do it. Philippians 4, who says, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say, Rejoice. There is something, there is something about rejoicing in the Lord. You can rejoice in other things, but it will not have the power. It will not give you the strength to overcome when you rejoice in the Lord that's where the power is you're not rejoicing because of what anything you're rejoicing in the Lord hallelujah come on let's go
there are some people in the body of Christ worldwide who believe that God must do it their way and they would refuse to do it God's way those people will never have the victory in their life because victory is only when we do things God's way there are people who will think that this is foolishness but let me tell you that the greatest king of Israel David he wrote 150 songs and this is the one he closed with praise ye the Lord praise God in his sanctuary praise him in the firmament of his power praise him for his mighty acts praise him according to his excellent greatness praise him with the sound of the trumpet praise him with the psaltery and harp praise him with the timbrel and dance praise him with the stringed instruments and organs praise him upon the loudest cymbals praise him upon the high sounding cymbals let everything that had breath praise the lord praise ye the lord so we're going to do it god's way
Praise the wonderful name of Jesus. Lord, we thank you so very much that you have ordained it this way, Lord, that while we wait and we pray, we can continue to rejoice and know that you are on the way, that you have a plan and your plan is perfect, that you're working behind the scenes and you're working it all out on our behalf. Oh, how we thank you for your goodness tonight. We thank you for your graciousness, your wonderful, wonderful Savior, and we will continue to praise you no matter what. Hallelujah. Come on. Precious God and Father, oftentimes I have said before your people that the Spirit works with the Word. And we have given them your Word, Lord. I pray now, as they have done what the Word has said, they have rejoiced in spite of the experience they may be having, like Habakkuk, they have rejoiced nonetheless, Lord. And so now I pray that you would 
undergird each and every one whom you sent this word for. Cause them to know that you are at work in their situation. Let there be a knowing within them that the God of Israel does not slumber nor sleep. I pray, wonderful Savior and God, that when they would have left here, they would have left with the understanding that God spoke to them specifically through his word and by his spirit. And precious Lord, they would embrace that word, that the rejoicing will not be just a done thing here, but they would go away rejoicing, continue rejoicing, and let there be rejoicing in their hearts. For it, Lord, I thank you and I praise you in Jesus' wonderful name. And with the saints of God say, Amen. Amen. Let me ask you a question. The word came from the Spirit to some of you here directly tonight. While you were rejoicing, were you thinking about the problem that faces you? You couldn't be. If you were still thinking about the problem, it means that you were not truly rejoicing. You were probably doing the motions. But there's one thing I am satisfied about. They say you can't fish and worry. Well, let me tell you, you could fish and worry. But you see, praise. You see, praise. <laughs> Them fellas went fishing last week, so, and all of them were worried. But you, you see, praise, you cannot truly praise God and worry at the same time. Praise, there is power in praise. There is power in praise. Hallelujah. God bless you richly. You may be seated. <laughs> Hallelujah. Oh, God is good, isn't he?